My name's Lawrence Timms, I'm from the RSPB, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. I am the head of application development support. We do a lot of technology stuff, believe it or not. We are Europe's largest nature conservation charity. Uh, and it's not just birds, actually, despite the logo. It's all nature, because it's all connected. We have about 200 preserves up and down the country, um, 1,500 staff, several thousand volunteers. We can't get by without all our volunteers. So that gives some idea of the size of us. We're not a tiny charity. We're reasonably large. Um, but what I want to talk to you today is about solving complex problems. It's the subject of the discussion today. Before I dive into that, I'd like to talk to you a bit about albatrosses. Albatrosses are very elegant creatures. They're kind of weird as well in many ways. It takes five years before they come to sexual maturity, before they're ready to start breeding. And they have a very long courtship and they pair up for life. And even when they do that, it can sometimes take up to another five years before they're ready to lay an egg. It all happens really, really slowly. And when they do lay an egg, it's just one at a time. The chick is fed on this really gross stuff called stomach oil that the albatrosses produce from their guts. And they produce it by taking very long trips out to sea where they feed on stuff like squid, fish, crabs, octopus, that kind of stuff. They're surface feeders, they sit on the surface of the water. Sometimes they dive down, sometimes they get whatever's on the surface. And they digest it and make this weird stomach oil stuff, which, by the way, really stinks. If you get it on you, you can't get rid of the smell like forever. And they come back and they regurgitate it into the chick. And the chick loves it. And they grow slowly. And eventually, the chick fledges and goes out. While one bird is out feeding for the chick, the other parent stays with the chick and looks after it, and then they swap over. That's how it works with albatrosses. And the other thing is, they lay so infrequently, sometimes they only lay an egg and raise a chick once every other year. So another thing that happens really slowly. The trouble is, we've been killing them for years. We've been killing them for their feathers, for the feather trade, We've been killing them by either deliberately or inadvertently releasing invasive species like mice and rats that spread disease and predate them. We've been hunting them. Uh, we've been chucking rubbish in the seas. They eat plastic. They think it's food. They, don't, they can't digest it. The chicks don't get fed. But above all else, the thing that kills more albatrosses than anything else is commercial longline fishing. This is a commercial fishing boat. Um, travels for weeks at a time, um, laying out long lines. I'll explain that how that works in a minute. It's a very effective way of fishing. Works really well. Uh, it's used all around the world. And the way it works is like this. The boat goes along, and a main line comes out behind it, up to several miles. It's suspended by buoys. And on the main line, you can see there are multiple branch lines. They're called snoods, if you want the technical term. Each branch line has bait and a big hook and a weight to make it sink to the right level. You get, you get lines that sink right down to the bottom of the ocean or they sit near the surface, depending on what kind of fish you want to catch. It's pretty straightforward. It's very effective. It's also very good as far as the fishermen are concerned because the fish tend to stay alive. They stay fresher for longer. So commercially, it's a good way of doing things. This, the bait that goes on the hooks is stuff like squid. I mentioned squid earlier on. It's the stuff that albatrosses like to eat. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance for the slide I'm about to show you. It's 
This is what happens. The albatrosses and other seabirds are attracted to the bait. When the main line comes out of the boat, the bait sits on the water for a few moments before the hook sinks. While it's there on the surface, the birds, the albatrosses, inevitably want to eat the bait. It's the food they eat. They get trapped on the hook. They can't get released. At best, you've got an albatross that is trapped on a hook and needs to be released, and it's injured. At worst, and usually, it sinks and it dies. It's drowned. Not just one dead albatross, but two, because the chick and the other parent waiting, well, the other parent has to go and eat itself. It's getting hungry. It eventually has to leave the chick behind, go out, feed itself, and the chick starves. Two dead, al two dead albatrosses. Research in the 1990s showed that in excess of 100,000 albatrosses were dying each year because of this. And the calculation in 2007 was that 19 out of 21 recognized species of albatross were threatened with extinction. The rate of death was exceeding the rate of birth. Simple as that. In 2005, something called the Albatross Task Force was formed. It was a cross-functional team. Scientists, conservationists, volunteers, specialists, experts in the area. And they recognized the problem. They saw where things were going with extinction. They knew something had to be done. In nine short years, in one particular fishery around South Africa, they reduced the problem of bycatch, which is the socially acceptable word we use for dead albatrosses on long lines, by 99%. Barely any dead albatrosses at all. It's an incredible statistic. How did they do it? It's, it sounds a bit like a soundbite statistic, doesn't it? Oh, wow, yeah, 99%. No, it was genuinely 99%. The question is, how did they go about doing that? How were they so successful? Now, just moving back to our industry for a minute, the IT industry, the industry of software development. There's a tendency in some quarters, let's call it the business, to think of there being a nice solution to a given IT problem. We talk about solution architecture. We talk about, is the solution ready? Is the solution complete? When will the solution be delivered? As if there can be one single solution to a technical problem. But we all know it's not really like that. We all know that the first solution you deploy is simply the first step in a whole world of change. There are bugs. There are feature requests. Everything changes. You're constantly adjusting the solution, solving problems. That's the reality of it. The ATF understood this as well. They realized from the outset that they, as the Albatross Task Force, could not simply go out there and fix this problem one way, once and for all, and have it done and dusted. They understood that. So rather than trying to sit in a room and come up with a big plan of how to fix this, they established a mechanism of being serial problem solvers. They knew they weren't just going to fix this in one go. That was their attitude. And when I read about what the Albatross Task Force had done on the intranet, and I went and spoke to some of the colleagues that had actually been involved with it, I <laughs> realized that what they're actually doing is DevOps. And that's what I want to talk about. Now in 2006, when the Albatross Task Force really starts to get to work, all of the necessary pieces to solve the problem were there. Now, these yellow things you're seeing on the red lines, they're bird scarers, streamers. They're just made of colored plastic. And they do exactly what you expect them to do. They scare birds away. You can see here, the birds aren't getting close to the streamers. Why weren't the fishermen using them? They work. Why was nobody using them? I don't know. The South African government had passed legislation to say that the fishermen had to use these. 
because they've been convinced that this was a good solution to the problem. But despite the legislation, no one was using them. Why? The ATF wanted to kickstart the system, get these mitigations that are out there already in use. So they made two key decisions after two days of discussion. First decision, they're only going to work in one place, South Africa. They're going to go to work in South Africa as their first target. Even though albatrosses were dying all around the world, if you imagine a circle all around Antarctica, all the way up to tip of South Africa, tip of um, South America, that's where albatrosses are, all around, they just said, let's go to South Af Africa, start there. The other decision they made was to get on the boats. They'd spent time with governments and trying to change policies and done a lot of work there. We're good at that, RSPB and all of our partners. But they said, we're not really going to understand this until we actually get on the boats and talk to the fishermen mm -hmm. and ask the captains and find out why these mitigations aren't being used. Try to kickstart the system. And if you can imagine what it's like on a fishing boat that's at sea, stinking of diesel and fish guts, being thrown around in the waves, possibly with fishermen that are speaking a language that's not the same as yours. It's not a particularly pleasant environment. So in many ways, these two decisions are pretty bold. It's bold to c allow other albatrosses around the world to continue to die, and it's bold to commit your scarce resource, your charity-funded resource, to go out to sea at weeks on end. Those are the decisions they made. This is DevOps thinking. This is the first way. This is systems thinking. There was a system. It wasn't working. It wanted to kickstart it. They wanted to get results. The first thing I want to draw attention to is something called the theory of constraints. You may have heard of it. But basically what we're talking about here is in any given system that's not working, there would be one constraint above all else that is the one that is most responsible for stopping your system working. Find that one constraint, elevate it, understand it, put all your attention into it, and flatten it out as much as possible. Once you've done that, move on to the next one. Don't try and solve all the problems at once. That's what they did. They went to work in that one place with the streamers, which we call mitigation for bycatch, get them working on the ships. They were regarded in 2005 when they started one fishing vessel using mitigations one time to save one albatross as success. So this points to the second point here, establish flow of value. What is value in any given system? To the albatross task force, value was fewer dead albatrosses. That's quite simple. They took that as their key measure of value from the outset. And as soon as they could see fewer dead albatrosses, they could see that there was flow of value in their system. And by working <coughs> only in South Africa and nowhere else, they were effectively limiting work in progress. They could have got their volunteers to start working on all the ships all around the Antarctic Circle, all at once. They decided that was an unwise move because they didn't understand the system well enough to know that that would be successful. Limit work in progress. And the fourth point here, and I will point out that I have cherry-picked the points of DevOps. Anybody that knows about DevOps knows there's a lot more to it than this. But these are the key ones. Deploy to production soonest. Get working. Get out there. Don't just sit around thinking about it. Don't sit around planning about it and theorizing about it. Go to work. Even though you might understand and you might accept that, actually, we don't know how successful this is going to be. We want some success, we want some value, we want some flow. That was their attitude from the outset, and that's how they began. So, they're out there, they're working, they're on the ships, and they're getting the streamers deployed behind fishing vessels. And all the time they're doing this, they're learning. They're learning things they could not have possibly known by sitting down and planning, and they're learning things they could have not possibly have known by sitting in government chambers talking to politicians. 
I'll give you an example. One of the ATF volunteers working on a fishing vessel was talking to one of the fishermen, and the fisherman was saying, I don't understand what the fuss is about. What do you mean? Well, there's that dead albatrosses. We don't like it. It's a real inconvenience. We've got to haul them in. They're very heavy. But what about all these baby albatrosses out here on the water as well? And the volunteer's going, what baby albatrosses? They're, they're not, that's... And the fisherman pointed to these other birds, small white birds that you could imagine might look like a miniature albatross. They're called storm petrels. They're not albatrosses. But the fishermen quite reasonably had thought they were simply young albatrosses. So the fishermen had quite reasonably assumed that because there were lots of baby albatrosses, in his mind, there wasn't a conservation problem. They didn't particularly want to kill albatrosses, but they couldn't imagine that the population was going down because of all the babies. There's no way we could have known that if we hadn't been on the ships. The ATF also began to understand that their initial metric of value, dead albatrosses, was simply not enough to understand the complexity of the system. Remember, we're talking about complex problems here. Any complex problem, there are multiple metrics, multiple measures. And until you get close to it, you don't understand what they are. The Albatross Task Force quickly realized that the only way to get a handle on this was to actually baseline everything. They spent the entire year of 2008 collecting data, barely doing anything more than collecting data, but multiple points of data for multiple factors and everything they could imagine and everything they'd learnt about, such as whether the lines were being set at night or day, what time of year it was in terms of fish movements and bird migration, uh, the dates and times of fishery closures according to the governments, um, little things like the position of the weight on the branch line. Was it quite high up the branch line or quite low down the branch line? Size of the hook, temperature of the water. They used special devices to collect this data. They literally had, as they described to me, with tongue-in-cheek, oceans of data. And only then did they begin to, begin to start to get a picture of what was working and what was not working. they discovered some very, very important factors. Seems obvious now as I say it, but the amount of time the bait is on the surface of the sea and how quickly it sinks is a key factor in how many albatrosses die. Now, it's, an, it's not enough just to know that. It's you have to get all the detailed data to understand what changes you make to that system have a positive result in the flow of value. They focused very much on the exact position of the weight on the line. And they spent ages just refining that and collecting data on it. And they discovered by the end of 2008 that just that one factor alone could make an 85% difference in the number of dead albatrosses, just focusing on that one mitigation. They also discovered, being on the ships, that the position of the weight on the line tended to be moved upwards by the fishermen because it made it less dangerous. When you're laying a baseline and you're putting it out there, if something gets snagged and pings back, you can imagine the difference between a weight at the end of a line that comes flying back and the weight at the top of a line that comes flying back. Fishermen have died being struck by these things. So having understood that, other people within the ATF went off to discover how they could prevent this kind of snagging from occurring to increase safety for the fishermen. All parts of the system thinking that they were doing. And all the time they were collecting this data, they were constantly feeding it back to themselves, to other scientists, to other researchers, and to governments, so that governments could improve the policies, and so other scientists could improve what they were doing. This is the second way in action. Feedback loops. First point here. Amplify and shorten feedback loops. And in fact, what I haven't said here is make more of them. In software engineering, we tend to think, well, let's put some software out there, and then the users will use it, and they'll tell us what they thought about it, and we'll feed that back into the backlog, and we'll make some changes, and we'll go again. And we'll maybe have a loop of a month, or a week, or a year, whatever it is, and that's your feedback loop. There's just one of them. We want more of them happening all the time, at all levels, all the time. More feedback all the time. And you power that by measuring everything. 
understand all the factors that affect the performance of your system and the flow of value. As you do that, refine the system. Think about what colour mitigations, what, what the colour of your plastic lines and the, the streamers, where are the weights, adjust them, what data do you get? Build testing in. Some quarters in software development still think of testing being that inconvenient thing that happens at the end. I know none of you do, but you understand what I mean. There's that thinking is still out that it's somebody else's problem that happens at the end, and you do it once, and it will be all be fine. The Albatross Task Force built this in at the beginning and the middle, at the end, all the time. They suffused their approach with testing. They assumed nothing. Everything was tested, everything was evaluated, everything was data driven all the time. The second way talks about testing as being something you build in from the outset. So by the end of the 2000s, the Albatross Task Force was beginning to expand its work out into different fisheries around the world. They had established a resilient practice of going into a fishery, understanding the problem, understanding the unique factors that were there in that fishery in terms of the ships that were being used, the practices of the fishermen, the kind of catch that was being landed, the kind of albatrosses that were there, and all the data points they needed. They were setting the problems up and they were knocking them down, setting them up and knocking them down. They had a culture of problem solving. They didn't go to any fishery expecting that what they'd done in South Africa was going to work somewhere else. They didn't make that assumption. So as they went to Argentina and the Falkland Islands and South Georgia, they understand the complexion of the problem, they pull their skills out of the bag, and they start solving it. That didn't mean that it worked everywhere either. Brazil is a massively tough nut to crack. Somebody sniggered last time I said that, and I didn't realise the pun, Brazil nuts. But in all seriousness, Brazil, culturally, for some reason, is very, very resistant to applying these mitigations to prevent bycatch. And as soon as you run into cultural problems, things get really sticky. How do you solve cultural problems? How do you overcome them? You can't just wheel out the data and say, well, this is good, that's better, do this, do that. Sometimes that's not enough. But the important thing here is that the ATF had established a culture within the conservation areas that were affected by this of innovation, experimentation, risk-taking, and an absence of fear of failure. So when Brazil was being really, really difficult, they weren't put off by it. They kept on trying. And at the same time, something that had been in development for several years, called the hook pod, this thing here, had a chance to flourish. The hook pod is an incredibly simple looking device. You can see that it encapsulates the sharp barbed hook completely. Little plastic thing hanging down is a scale model of a squid. So the bait is attached to the hook, the hook pod conceals the hook, and as you can see by the fisherman laying it out there, it goes in the ocean. When the hook is covered, the albatross can't get caught on the hook, and the magic happens when the hook pod sinks. At a certain pre-programmed depth, the hook pod opens, the hook comes out, and it catches fish. It took 10 years to get this small enough and economic enough to be usable and deployable. But the important point here is, without the work that the Albatross Task Force had done in the first place, there never would have been any of adoption of the hook pod, even if it had been developed successfully. They created a culture where the hook pod could be taken on and used on fishing vessels. Here's a quote. It's from a Brazilian fishing boat captain. I really like the equipment and I intend to keep using it. He's decided to keep using it. They haven't had to force it on fishing vessels. He's decided. In his opinion, it's a mitigation measure more efficient than any of the other things that they do. But here's the key. 
This man regards it as a pleasure to help develop this technology. Rather than being part of the problem, he's become part of the solution. He's helping to contribute. This is the culture that the Albatross Task Force created. This is the third way of DevOps, continuous learning. Continuous learning encapsulates experimentation, taking risks, being prepared, or in fact inspecting to fail. You've heard it said, I'm sure, there is no progress without failure. The Albatross Task Force actively searched for failure because they knew without failure they would never understand which mitigations worked and which didn't. Where success was, they're vectoring towards it. In continuous learning, we also talk about the scientific method. The scientific method or the empirical method being transparency, inspection, adaptation. Transparency being open about your data, open about your successes, open about your failures, clarity of all the things you're doing, clarity about all the places it's going wrong, all the things you try to do that messed up, all the things that refused to work properly, with no shame about that. Inspection, looking at them, analysing them, understanding them. Adaptation, meaning continually steering based on what you've learned. We tend to be fairly politically correct at the RSPB, outward facing. We're not allowed to say things like killing two birds with one stone, although we do say stuff like that in the office. And in the office, we also have a little analogy we like to use here about the scientific method. We like to compare guns and guided missiles. So with a gun, you aim it, and you hope that when you pull the trigger, the bullet's going to hit the target. Once it's fired, there's nothing you can do. It's gone. You know, it hits the target or it doesn't. The scientific method allows you to build a guided missile. We paint a target of pretty much where we want this software product to end up. Something like that. Some over there, a bit like that. Fire, off it goes, guided missile. And as the data comes back from the guided missile, the product team that are building the product as they go along, we start to understand what's going on, we learn more from the users, we learn more from our data, and we adjust as we go along. Sometimes we self-destruct, pull the plug, stop doing it, it's not going to work. Sometimes we adjust, sometimes we pause, sometimes and then we continue. That's how it should be, surely. Very easy thing to say, very hard to put into practice because your barriers are culture. So what is this thing about culture? I've wrestled with this for quite a while. How do you change culture? How do you create a culture like the Albatross Task Force did that permits experimentation, that permits failure? What I've begun to understand is you don't create culture, you create a climate by what you do, what you say, how you behave, how you treat people, the role models you set out, creates a climate in which culture may emerge over time. Now I could drill into that a whole deal, that's a whole other conversation. But the actions that you take and the passion that you show and the behaviour that you express gives rise to adjustments in culture over time. The Albatross Task Force had the advantage of building this culture in from the outset in everything they did and said and the way they worked. So they were able to establish their own culture and that followed on through with them. In an established organisation, if you're somewhere where people play the blame game, like say, oh, you did that badly or that didn't work, that was terrible, what a, what a mistake. No one admits to failure, you don't learn anything. It's one of the first things you have to do as a leader, is admit to your own mistakes, admit to your own failures, and show everybody else that it's okay for them to admit to theirs too. Tough thing to do. Did the Albatross Task Force know they were doing DevOps? No, they didn't understand that. When I spoke to Ollie Yates, who is the man at the RSPB, who's the head of the Albatross Task Force in the UK, and I talked about this, and I talked to DevOps. 
uh, talked to him about DevOps. He understood what it all meant. Oh, yeah, I get that. Never heard of it. Sounds great. Yep, that's exactly what we did. Didn't know it, but definitely what we did. That's a really good way of working. That's what they did. That's how they make this thing work. That's how they saved the albatross. The reason is they understood from the outset that the problem they were trying to solve was a complex one. Your problems are complex too. IT problems are complicated. If they were simple, everyone would be doing it. They're not simple. They're complex problems. And people that work in IT, software developers, tend to be extremely good serial problem solvers. Like the Albatross Task Force. No as soon as you've fixed one bug, another one pops up. And I know you throw your hands up in despair, but then you get on with it. And again and again, at all levels, repeatedly, as a team and individually. That's what you do. So I would say that the scientific method embodied by DevOps, transparency, inspection, adaptation, and the passion and the emotion related to wanting to do a good job wanting to make things better, in the case of the ATF, wanting to save the albatross, are the two things, the two ingredients you need to drive you forward to success. Without those two things, you really won't make the progress that you have as your potential. The Albatross Task Force has told me they're not going to exist forever. They go out there, they solve the problems, they make it work, and then they hand it over it's their intention to hand it over to local government agencies so they can teach them how to do the same kind of thing. Get on the ships, make sure things are working, and do a five-year review, make sure the mitigations are still being used, and then come and fix it if they need to. They don't feel they themselves need to be the heroes. They want to expand that culture of serial problem solving into other places around the world. So I recommend to you, as development teams, that you embrace the teaching that DevOps has to offer. Take what you can and learn from it, because it does work. It works in all walks of life, whether you know you're doing DevOps or not. Take what you can from it, put it to work, and see how you can benefit. Thank you very much. <coughs>